talk for probably about 45 minutes or so, and then I'll have a response. I have up to 15 minutes, but I'll probably take a little less than that even to leave time for a QA. and a um, So I'll start with the introduction. So first, I want to say thanks to everyone for taking the time uh, to travel here under the conditions of what many are calling a seventh wave, uh, I think, of COVID. Uh, of course, this conference was first planned to occur during what became COVID's first wave. Uh, as my first com conference pandemic casualty, Petrocultures 2020 uh, turned 2022, holds a unique place uh, in my personal and professional life. I first heard uh, murmurings of its possibilities at Petrocultures 2018 in Glasgow, and some of you were, uh, were there. And in this sort of transitory space at the tail end of my PhD in 2019, I helped with some of the logistics, uh, then bedded some of the papers uh, as I looked forward to the conference in Norway's uh, oil capital. But we were delayed once in 2020 and then once again in 2021. But what's important, I think, is that we're here now uh, and I feel fortunate to finally be here with everyone to think about oil and the potential futures beyond as encapsulated in the conference theme which is transformations. So as I said, I'll introduce uh, Oksana with a brief bio and a bit of a reflection on my encounters with her work. She'll speak for 45 minutes, maybe 50, since I'm gonna go short uh, in my responding comments. Uh, so without uh, delaying further, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Oksana Timofeeva, who is a philosopher from St. Petersburg and the author of books like the most recent Solar Politics uh, from Polity in 2022, How to Love a Homeland uh, from Kei Fata in 2020, History of Animals from Bloomsbury uh, in 2018, and Introduction to the Erotic Philosophy of Georg Bataille from New Literary Observer in 2009. Uh, Oksana is a professor at the European University at St. Petersburg, a lead researcher at Tumen Un State University, and a member of the art collective uh, Cho Delat which translates to what is to be done, a reference I think many of us uh, understand. So anyway, I first uh, encountered Oksana's work through her really excellent 2017 essay in Eflux titled Ultra Black Towards a Materialist Theory of Oil. And in it, she critically maps the state of materialist thought today, those conflicting and congruent sets of orientations often called new or historical to set up a sharp intervention that revealed how oil is a kind of material planetary unconscious. And I really recommend reading the essay if you haven't read it yet. More recently, her solar politics employs these kinds of materialist lines of sight developed in pieces like Ultra Black to argue for a shift from visions of uh, a solar economy. So prevalent in green capitalist discourse in which the sun is merely fuel uh, to, to a more expansive or yeah, it, that understands fuel as sun as fuel uh, to argue instead for a more expansive radical form of solar politics. And so in this book, a major inflection of this politics is that rather than fuel, uh, as Oksana suggests it, the sun is instead a comrade. Given the opportunity to suggest names for keynotes uh, by the conference's main organizers, I immediately thought of Oksana's work in these two energetic trajectories oil status as what she calls the core of our capitalist unconscious on the one hand and the horizon of possibility offered by solar politics on the other. And so with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Oksana Timofeeva. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am happy that so many people managed to come, although nature today is so beautifully rebellious. And, uh, and the morning is quite early, but uh, uh, I also, yeah, thank you, uh, Jordan, for this nice introduction. I actually could have spoken about solar politics or uh, the material unconscious or something um, of this kind uh, 
more towards uh, metaphysics, elemental metaphysics and uh, philosophy. Uh, but today I decided to concentrate on, uh, on uh, a simple topic. I will talk about something really simple, uh, and uh, I would uh, formulate it for myself as rather Russian oil in human geographies of the war. Um, so I'm thankful to, uh, to the organizers who brought me here, uh, and uh, happy uh, for the uh, to have an opportunity to speak in this conference today. This was not easy, and, I'm, uh, and my long trip was preceded by a couple of weeks of suspense that began uh, with the discussions within the European Union of the possible entry ban uh, for on Russian citizens due to the war. Leaving aside political and moral aspects of the problem, a similar suspense was already experienced back in 2020 uh, with the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Those who labeled the restrictive quarantine border policies of the national state states as a rehearsal of the new Cold War did not predict that the war that will follow after the two years of the pandemic will not be cold at all um, during the pandemic rehearsal, international travels were limited for the people, but uh, mostly remained uh, unlimited for money and commodities. In contrast, economic and political sanctions introduced as a response to the Russian military aggression in Ukraine seem to affect also money and commodity flows between my country and the rest of the world. However, there is something that remains almost untouched by these policies, something for which even the most iron curtain doesn't seem to be an obstacle. It is much easier to introduce an entry ban um, on the people than on some sort of commodities, such as crude oil and natural gas. There are discussions uh, on the possible embargo, indeed. But they are not so loud. There are even some attempts to weaken the resource ties between Russia and Europe. There is a call to reduce the consumption of Russian oil and gas, which ascribes to the general call to, um, uh, to the transition to renewable and energy sources uh, to get greener and cleaner, etc but something still makes things keep going. Uh, here I show this picture. You probably know what is this. Uh, these are, um, so there are largest reserves uh, of natural gas in Siberia. Soviet Union uh, exported it from the 1940s and even at the most critical moments of the Cold War, it maintained a stable delivery. Uh, nowadays, Russian gas uh, still, is still cheaper than its alternatives. Although, as you probably know, uh, yesterday, gas prices reached like really, got really high. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but still, still is cheaper than as, uh, than alternatives. And regardless of the economic sanctions, even since the annexation of Crimea in, um, in of Crimea in uh, 2014 and Russian invasion in Ukraine in 2022, Russia and Europe remain partners. Only so there are two pipes: uh, Nord Stream One and Nord Stream Two. Uh, that run uh, under the Baltic Sea from Russia to Germany. Nord Stream 1 is the longest uh, subsea pop pipeline in the world from uh, the, the blue one, uh, which uh, runs from Viborg uh, near Finland. Uh, and it operates from 2012, um, but only one line is, is open now. There was an interesting story with that. Um, it, uh, uh, the, second uh, the, the other line was closed in June for the, for the 
renovation. Uh, they had to uh, uh, to renovate it in Canada somehow, but due to the payment transfer, something delay, it is still uh, it is still closed. So only one is open now, and then. Nord Stream 2, uh, which goes from um, Usluga near Estonia, uh, and uh, uh, the lane was carried out in 2018-2021. Uh, uh, but in Germany, no, wait, no, sorry, in, in February 2002, Germany suspended certification of the Nord Stream uh, 2 in response to the Russian military aggression. So the second one, the, uh, the, the, the red one, doesn't work. Uh, and uh, and uh, something from the recent news. Um, it is just just one of the recent news uh, uh, saying that um, Gazprom will stop all gas flows for, uh, to Europe uh, via the Nord Stream pipeline from August 31 until September 2. Uh, and um, and that's the reason why the prices are so high, because Germany and other countries must buy as much gas as they can within this short limit, because they also um, there is an, an uncertainty. What if they will not open the, the pipeline again after the, these three days of the renovation, and so on? So. Interesting moments. And uh, another news uh, was from August 19 that Germany, um, a politician, uh, one German politician says Germany should allow the block Nord Stream 2 pipeline to begin pumping Russian natural gas uh, so people do not have freeze in winter and that our industry does not suffer serious damage. He comments, um, prompted a fierce response from Kyiv, um, where Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said, addiction to Russian gas kills. Um, yeah, uh, and these debates are also today. They are, um, if you see the news, uh, also today, these uh, ideas are uh, debated uh, in Germany. Uh, another, now I switch to Comrade Oil. Uh, this is friendship, Druzhba. Uh, the world's uh, longest oil pipeline, uh, which is 4,000 uh, kilometers long, and it begins in Tatarstan, uh, where it collects all oil. It's actually um, the pipeline network begins much more to the, uh, to the east, uh, it collects uh, oil from other pipelines running from Western, uh, Western Siberia, Urals, and Caspian Sea, and transports it from Russia and Kazakhstan through uh, Ukraine and Belarus to Europe. So uh, the, the pipeline is a, is a Soviet uh, heritage. Uh, it was designed to provide all supplies from the Soviet Union to the countries of the, uh, to the, countries of the socialist bloc. Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, GDR, and Hungary. And it was constructed from uh, 1958 to 1964. So now Druzhba, which means friendship uh, in Russian, brings uh, crude oil to Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Austria, and Germany, from where it led the oil, uh, it, uh, it, um, the oil goes further to Western, uh, Western Europe uh, via other pipelines. Interesting, interestingly, throughout the course of the war, basic agreements on transportation of oil from Russia to Europe via Ukraine uh, remain in force and effect. Infrastructures intact, oil flows through its pipes smoothly, and the money is paid on time. Even the slightest inter interruption uh, caused anxiety when, for instance, the recently the section of the pipeline was stopped for seven days because of the difficulties with the international bank transfer due to the sanctions. So that was the news. Um, 
they could not transfer oil via Ukraine because um, because of them. Well, you can read it um, because um, uh, there, there were this no, this transfer problems, but then the European Bank um, agreed to make a transaction because it was too problematic. Yeah. So what do we see? Ukrainian cities are on fire. Civil infrastructures and even the large, largest nuclear power plant in Europe, Zaporizhna, uh, Zaporizhka nuclear power station is troubled. But not pip pipelines. Oil flows from Russia to Ukraine and then to Europe. Ukraine receives money, Russia receives money. And there is a good example of what Druzhba friendship can mean in capitalist world. Serious business as a real friendship behind the stage of the theater of war. I was puzzled by this. I had this existential moment of a surprise. Like, how come? Um, I mean, there is still this discourse that business is, is outside of politics. So it's, there is no politics in it, that there are things that must be maintained. But philosophically speaking, there is, a, there is a problem of truth. If something causes so, this moment of surprise, so to say, wondering, then probably there is a truth there somehow, somewhere beneath the, the ground, underground. Um, at the bottom of the oil well. Uh, well. Um, this is another map. So it's, it's all about kind of geography. I'm not a geographer, no, but, uh, but uh, I don't even pretend. But these are the, uh, the pipelines of oil, gas, ammonia somehow is also here, um, of like uh, explosive sub substances that go uh, in one direction, in one direction from east to west. Uh, you see that there are other um, uh, gas pipelines are in green, oil pipelines are in, in red. So uh, the oil going to Europe is mostly Druzhba, and there are, uh, there are pipelines of Brotherhood uh, uh, and, um, and Yamal, um, Nord Stream, Soyuz, Central Asian gas. Um, so all comes from east to west, one direction. Um, then a little bit uh, to remind you about the film that we saw yesterday, Russian oil mostly comes from Siberian, Taiga, forest tundra and tundra. Mm, uh, thus in uh, Surgut region where I'm from, uh, one of the industrial centers of petroleum, uh, a, there are uh, forests and swamps. Although it doesn't, um, uh, doesn't lie beyond the polar circle, the territory is still uh, counted as far north. And um, Russians, uh, well, not Russians, I, I mean, um, yes, Russians came here uh, after the, uh, the conquest of Siberia in the 17th century. But the real process of urban development started in, uh, in the 1960s when gigantic oil fields were discovered beneath the layers of the permafrost. Uh, so it was in the Soviet era. Um, but uh, so we, we see uh, the Nordin donkey. It's like the animals of tundra. Uh, but there are other animals of tundra that are not counted in these um, in this industrial developments. Other inhabitants of tundra, um, people and uh, deer, and other animals. 
geologists, oil men, and builders arrived, um, uh, and the Soviet cities started to grow in the region. But already long before that, um, uh, Siberia was and still uh, is populated by uh, by multiple small nomadic indigen nations, such as Kanti, Mansi, or Nienzi, or um, well, many. Also, if we go uh, more east, there are um, uh, there are a lot of indigent people there, but some of them already either on uh, either uh, really uh, disappearing or already or already disappeared. Um, some legislation measures were taken to defend these nations um, uh, with their unique pagan cultures and trades. Nothing, however, uh, can really prevent their extinction, as the traditional ways of living, reindeer breeding, hunting, and fishing are incompatible with the petroleum industry. The process of uh, extraction uh, is um, uh, on the far north is technologically difficult and ecologically disastrous. Uh, oil fields um, replace uh, reindeer feeds. Uh, oil spills poison rivers, uh, forests and swamps, making it unsuitable for reindeers and fish. The more the industry advances, the, the more indigent people, together with the tiny herbs, uh, back off to the forest and tundra. Uh, the North is, is infinite, a popular Soviet song sings, but in fact it's not. Uh, so today, uh, Siberian uh, indigents are being pushed to the edge of the North, uh, uh, kicked um, of their uh, territories, basically. Um, I had one example of uh, indigenous re resistance, uh, it, it from the... Um, uh, it was several years ago uh, from uh, my place. Uh, it's, it's very local. Uh, for instance, this, this guy, Sergei Kichimov, uh, uh, in September uh, 2014 shot, shot the dog uh, that belonged to the oil workers. Uh, he did that because, uh, because um, this or other dog um, beat to death was one of his uh, reindeers. Uh, and endured the other one. Sergei Kichimov uh, is not an ordinary man, by the way. He uh, is, um, is a, he's a shaman. Uh, he's a garden of the lake uh, Imlor, a sacred uh, Surgut Hanti site, which is now surrounded by multiple oil and gas uh, clusters. And uh, the interesting thing that was, uh, was that um, the company, um, the biggest Surgut company uh, discovered um, uh, discovered oil just um, beneath the lake, and uh, they wanted they were trying to drill there, and uh, there was a lot of pollution. and And the shaman uh, Sergey, uh, the shaman, he uh, he became a blogger. Uh, he did the videos on YouTube, and he was. He was showing how the, the forest tundra is getting uh, polluted by, uh, by oil spills everywhere uh, and how, um, how uh, it is disastrous. So by January 2015, he was charged with, with criminal assault. And in the fall 2016, he was uh, convicted of threatening to kill the rig work workers. Um, so as Maria Favorsky, representative from the Greenpeace, commented on this, locals see the charges as a blatant attempt by the oil industry to scare off indigenous opposition to oil drilling and to get, re uh, to get rid of a man who literally stood um, in its way. So now he is released, but, um, but uh, it is only one example of a possible kind of ways of resistance uh, of, a, of a singular individual uh, against the cooperative uh, machine. Um, now, I, uh, a little bit of creativity. There is another map. Um, 
I called it um, petrostate or circulation one before the war. In his uh, book, Nature's Evil, A Cultural History of the Natural Resources, uh, Russian uh, historian Alexander Etkin defined, uh, defines Russia as a petrostate, the concept borrowed from Fernanda Coronil, who is also seated here um, uh, at this conference. Um, petrostate is a state which, Coronil also uh, calls it a magical state, which, like medieval sovereigns, has two bodies. The first body is people, and the second body is oil. This division is important. I will come uh, back to it soon. Coronil's example of Petro State is Venezuela. Uh, in 1938, it became the bigger world, uh, world exporter uh, of oil, and the state received money from oil, which, is planned to which it planned to use for the improvement of the life of the people. However, instead uh, of building new factories and universities, the government took on more and more debt on account of future oil production. After all, the, the state collapsed. And similar story happened to the late Soviet Union, uh, whose economy ended up entirely relying on, on the export of fossil fuels. And same happens with today's Russia and other authoritarian states. I would say uh, that the specificity of Russia as a petro state is that it, it, it's, it's really very big and multinational. Um, it's called Russian Federation. Um, although those in, empire, uh, those in power think of it as an empire, we can introduce as term Petro-imperialism. Petro-imperialism. So the concept of the petro-state is closely related to, to another one, the oil curse, which was uh, introduced by Michael Ross, also, uh, also mentioned here many times. Um, and uh, the question raised by Ross was why, in certain countries, instead of economic growth, an extraction of fossil fuels brings to social economic political and cultural degradation? This is really, really an interesting question. Oil, uh, and there is an explanation there. Oil revenues are unstable and non-transparent. They promise prosperity to the people, but often only bring enormous wealth to the elites, while the rest of the population becomes poorer and poorer. Petro states have enormous incomes, part of which can be redistributed in favor of the population, which thus depends on the generosity of the elites. Uh, if most of the income uh, comes from oil, the state neither depends, neither really depends uh, on such things as taxation, that is people's labor, nor does it need to develop high technologies, education, etc. And, um, and in fact, uh, the government of the Petro state does not really need people. But we remember there are two bodies, the body of the people and the body of oil. The, that is the sacred body of the Petro state, the magical, uh, the magical doubling. Um, there are, however, states that manage to avoid the oil curse. Norway is the best example. According to Etkind, the secret is that there are countries with good democratic and bad authoritarian institutions. Most of authoritarian petro states are characterized by big inequality rate, excessive luxury consumption of the elites, corruption, patriarchal oppression of women, religious fundamentalism, the lack of proper cultural development and education, um, ecological catastrophes, etc. Due to the lack of transparency and civil control, all oil money goes directly or un indirectly into the pockets of private persons, uh, petro machos, so men around the pipe. A small group of the people in power become richer and richer, and as the society gradually collapses, they prefer to, uh, to have their acti actives abroad, sending their children to, uh, to European, American, or British universities, buying overseas properties such as villas or yachts or whatever. And thus, after all, as the arrow now points, oil money received, so first, uh, um, 
first gas and oil go, go from east to west. And then uh, oil money received from abroad actually go back uh, abroad as private capitals of those who rule the, the state and who are not interested in investing in their own country or also spending their money in their own country. So all go goes uh, from east to the west, but via Moscow. So there are three points actually. Moscow is not, uh, when I lived in Surgut, everybody was saying, oh, Moscow takes all, all the, <clears throat> well, we, uh, we extract oil, but Moscow takes the money. But uh, then Moscow sends the uh, spend the money in in Europe or elsewhere, mm, Dubai. Um, so it's actually again kind of a one directional uh, movement. So did you get it right? Uh, I'm not a, a good uh, drawer, but um, so uh, indeed. Um, Etkin is right that there are countries with bad and good institutions and that the reason why Russia fall into a trap of the oil curse is that its institutions are particularly bad. Uh, however, and he, uh, he also understands that the reason why it is so is this imperial structure, uh, colonial structure. Um, however, I would like to make uh, one more step and argue that the oil curse is not only a problem of each particular country, but a systemic problem of the global petrocapitalism. Uh, I will come back to it at the very end of the paper. But now, uh, so as this picture uh, shows, like, but this uh, situation could not last forever. For together with the growth of inequality, social antagonism escalates. Thus, uh, shortly before the war, like in 2020-2021, uh, 2020, the situation in Russian society was highly explosive and close to revolutionary. There were a huge protest rallies uh, where people ex expressed uh, dissatisfaction with Putin's politics, fake elections, corruption, poli police brutality, etc. The protests were uh, severely repressed, but people began to lose fear and each new repression could become a trigger for new protests. Uh, the most obvious example, uh, people's support of Alexei Navalny. It was not uh, as much uh, for Navalny as, as against Putin. And um, uh, one of the main slogans of this huge uh, movement was no to the Tsar. Uh, and you can, uh, you can actually um, imagine, well, I have another map here. Um, imagine, uh, this is another shaman. Um, I will, uh, his name is, uh, this shaman comes from Yakutia, uh, from Saha. Uh, it's one of the uh, republics uh, on the very uh, far, in, uh, Far East, it's not Siberia. Uh, and uh, he, in uh, one second, in 2019, first he began in 2019, but then, then in, in 2018, 2019, uh, he mm, um, began uh, a walking. Uh, walking march uh, from uh, Yakutsk to Moscow, where he planned to, uh, to perform. So you, you can see all the way from Yakutsk to Moscow. It's more than 8,000 uh, 8, kilometers. And he decided to walk all the way there. He just took his like a small carriage uh, and a dog. Uh, and, um, um, and then and then people uh, began to join him slightly. And when he reached already uh, the next uh, big republic, Buryatia, it was already quite a big crowd. So you can imagine the movement of people from east to west. Uh, so his idea was the, uh, of this rally uh, to Moscow. He, uh, he promised to perform there a ritual um, uh, a ritual to cause Putin to resign. Uh, he was saying Russia must be liberated. 
<clears throat> and people believed him because they were desperate, because there was no hope. It seemed to be like so bad. The situation seemed to be so bad. And uh, people began to believe the shaman from, from Yakutia and join him. So the crowd would, you, you could imagine the perspective of this movement, uh, movement, which could be bigger and bigger and bigger when it reached Moscow, but in Buratia, he was stopped and arrested. Um, Putin got scared because they also believe uh, the shamans, uh, and uh, and he was uh, uh, then arrested and being sentenced to an inv uh, involuntary confinement in a psych psychiatry hospital multiple times, and he is still in a psychiatry hospital. As you know, what is a political abuse of psychiatry? You can imagine there are tortures, and they give you. Uh, medicine so that, uh, well, you are destroyed as a, as a person. And this is another picture from Yakutia. So this place of force, I really love uh, this region, although I've never been there. Um, what comes from Yakutia, not oil, not gas, but uh, what is now called bloody diamonds, bloody diamonds. The, the most expensive thing in order to avoid sanctions, bloody diamonds first go to India, then rebrand it, and, um, and then go uh, and then are distributed further. Um, and uh, yeah, they bring enormous money to, uh, to finance the war. Um, so, but, uh, but uh, back in 2021, before the war, there were protests um, in January um, for, uh, in support of Alexei Navalny uh, that started, um, and they began uh, there again at the Far East because, uh, because of the time zones, uh, all uh, Russian protest rallies usually began on the very Far East, like in St. Petersburg, it's, it's like seven o'clock in the morning and you open the news and you see this picture like uh, an afternoon in Yakutsk under minus 50, minus 50 Celsius. Uh, people are uh, protesting there. It's, it was unbelievable. And then, and then it was like this. Uh, then um, uh, other territories went on protests. And by the evening, it was already somewhere in like, I don't know, Kaliningrad. Um, and uh, one could imagine the scale of the protest movement, but I'm going back to, uh, to the map. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was another example. So uh, I will now introduce a certain argument. Um, no to the Tsar. One of the slogans was no to the Tsar. Uh, so you see, not only oil can move from east to west, but another kind of energy, uh, a protest energy, revolutionary energy, the spiritual energy of the shaman as a diplomat between, um, uh, as a representative of a you know, high diplomacy between nature and, uh, and politics and uh, the country. So um, back in 2020, when after holding the state power for 20 years, Putin changed the Russian, Russian constitution in order to um, uh, get a li uh, lifelong presidency, I was thinking that the new revolution in Russia was just a matter of time. However, I did not take in, into account one more possibility for this regime to save itself. Instead of a revolution, we got the war. Moreover, what seems to be a usual autocratic government, um, uh, governance, um, among many others, rapidly took a fascist turn. Um, behind every fascism, there is a failed revolution. This famous sentence is often attributed to Walter Benjamin, although it's not a direct quote, but rather in, uh, an interpretation of some of his fragments. Thus, in the work of art, in the age of mechanical reproduction, Benjamin states, 
fascism attempts to organize the newly proletari proletarianized masses without affecting the property structure, which the masses strive to eliminate. In the same vein, in his article, Psychological Structure of Fascism, written in 1933-34, Georges Bataille characterizes fascism as an imperative response to the growing threat of the working class movement. Both authors uh, claim that fascism emerges as a means to neutralize the growing social antagonism by creating a national unity of the oppressors uh, and the oppressed around one, str one strong leader. And this, this mechanism works. Uh, it worked uh, in Germany in the 30s. It works uh, in Russia uh, now. So it recanalizes the energy of revolution into military aggression towards an external enemy. And then we see uh, the, next, the next map. As you can see, one arrow disappears because of the sanctions. The, 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 second, the, the, the last green arrow disappeared. Money do not really go back to Europe. They go, but mm, not, <laughs> not that much. Uh, but mostly, uh, they are transformed. What, uh, so gas and oil still go from east to, uh, to west. Money still go uh, from west to Moscow. And what goes from Moscow where? Weapons, uh, tanks, bombs go to Ukraine. Um, so, basic structure for the two maps before, before the war, uh, before, uh, before the war. Oil and gas come, for, uh, come to Europe from Siberia and other regions. Money come from Europe to Moscow and then from Moscow back to Europe. What goes back to Siberia? Nothing. After, oil and gas still come to Europe from Siberia and other regions. Money still come from Europe to Moscow. But now, because of the sanctions, all oil money does not go back to Europe, but mostly spent on the war against Ukraine. So there are two parallel arrows. Um, the red one, friendship, friendship, oil, um, oil flow, druzhba, uh, and, uh, and war, the black arrow. Uh, both goes from Russia to Ukraine, in a way. Uh, and uh, and this is a like a hidden dialectics of of petro capitalism friendship and war together Parad a paradox uh, there are debates now uh, about uh, claiming Russia as a uh, uh, claiming Russia the state a sponsor a sponsor of terrorism but the question raises who sponsors the sponsor there is a little bit of a barber paradox, who shaves the barber, you know, who sponsors the sponsor. Um, but two more lines are missed in this map, actually. You can just imagine them. They are also can be black. Um, apart from oil and gas, what now goes to Ukraine? From the regions, from the east, regions of Russia are the troops, the people. The body of the people, as Russia does not recognize its aggression in Ukraine as a real war, it can only use a contract army. The great number of contract soldiers are coming from the poorest regions of Russia uh, and uh, poorest regions and families. There are people who do not see other possibilities to survive, who consider killing or being killed uh, as a decent, for a decent salary. Now. There is something that actually some of them were not paid. They now received and uh, they now returned from, the, from Ukraine and they are unhappy because they could not receive the money, uh, the money that were promised to them. Um, uh, and uh, sometime if they returned. But the families, the families uh, if you die, uh, a family receives uh, money uh, and uh, yeah. The, the, there is a lot of um, discussions about it. Uh, so now, um, is there something that goes back to Siberia? So 
you, you can imagine one, one more black arrow uh, from east to west uh, troops uh, to Ukraine. Uh, what goes back um, from Ukraine to Siberia and other, other regions? Uh, what is called in Russia Cargo 200. Uh, that is dead corpses of soldiers in zinc coffins. Two uh, hundreds, that's how they are called. Um, although many people today raise objections, uh, objections against any comparisons between Putin's Russia, Hitler's Germany, and Mussolini's Italy, I insist on a certain structural homology of these regimes for which fascism can work as a generic term. Thus, among some basic elements that they share, there is one that is crucial for my father argument, a nostalgia for some great empire of the past, which cultivates the feeling of, um, the feeling of ethnic, religious, cultural, natural, or other superiority of a nation whose political ethos uh, is reduced to the ideas of the war of conquest, restoring the glory of the old days, and domination over other groups and territories. There is a connection between imperialism and fascism, but it's not direct. It's not that every, uh, every claim for the restoration of the old, old empire is necessarily pregnant with fascist or uh, proto-fascist ideology. This is... Um, no, this is Putin's dream. Uh, oh, no, uh, this is not. It's, it's um, this one. Um, this is a Russian, uh, Russian Empire's expansion. Uh, you, can, you can see on the map how, how it develops from, um, uh, yeah. So, um, my concept. Fascism is the death drive of the empire. In his essay, Why War, written in 1933, Freud writes, the death instinct becomes an impulse to, to destruction when, with the aid of certain organs, it directs its actions outwards against ex external objects. The living being, that is to say, defends its own existence by destroying foreign bodies. Um, in this perspective, and, uh, and then Freud um, uh, for it applies it to a nation. It's saying a nation wants to, it tries to destroy itself. Revolution, think about the revolutionary moment. Uh, this empire wants to, tries to disintegrate. It, it has a, like a, a death drive as a positive, as a posi as a positive for, force. But this collective death drive is redirected towards another people. So the the, the, the imperialist nation is trying to save itself, to preserve itself, and attacks the neighbor. Um, a relevant term, also a relevant term, necro-imperialism, introduced now by Ukrainian philosopher Nikolai Karpitsky. And uh, another good term, which is, uh, which, can, uh, which is also relevant here, I think, um, proposed by Kara Daggett, uh, fossil fascism. Uh, she um, um, discusses this, uh, she introduces uh, this term uh, in the framework of a discussion on petro uh, masculinity and in, in her book, um, in her essay on fossil uh, fuels and authoritarian states and uh, desire, 2018, um, discussions around the growth of uh, the far right, uh, the Western far right. Uh, against uh, climate, um, climate and climate uh, environmental activism and so on. And uh, this term was picked up in, uh, by Andreas Malm and Zetkin Collective in their book, uh, Why, White Skin, Black Fuel, The Dangerous of Fossil Fascism, where, uh, where Malm uh, criticized uh, liberal theories of fascism, that is, that fascism emerges where there is no enough capitalism. And uh, he claimed uh, that um, uh, today, um, in fact, reincarnation of fascism is brought not by the luck, but by the excess of capitalism. Uh, what he says, but if fossil fascism is now a danger, it is because capitalism has been left to its own devices, unthreatened by um, overthrow uh, and adulterated in inhibitively productive uh, of ecological crisis. Uh, and um, 
And he discusses like several options, uh, a couple of options. How would we imagine the development of a possible fossil um, uh, fascism? Sen a certain scenarios. But the, the Russian scenario was not predicted, was not expected somehow. Well, it was, but, um, uh, um, but somehow it was not fantasized and advised. Okay, should we apply this term to you know, Putinism? Fossil fascism. Um, you know, Russian liberal critics of Putin's regime often think that his entire project is the restoration of the Soviet Union. But this is not quite true. Uh, Putin's dream was to restore the Russian Empire, which is like purely capitalist uh, colonial dreams. Um, uh, capitalist in the sense of a, uh, of a primitive accumulation uh, and it's like basic initial state that um, that is appropriation of natural resources. Nature is a giver. Uh, nature, uh, so every capitalism, uh, capitalist enterprise begins from taking something for free. Uh, you do not pay. You do not, uh, nature doesn't receive anything um, when we take, when it gives us oil, gas, and diamonds. Uh, so uh, this is uh, like the beginning of, uh, of the process, uh, the basic, it's basic element. Uh, here is, oh no, it's not that picture. Uh -huh, this picture. Uh, here's just a little bit of uh, prehistory, uh, histo historical co context of uh, colonization of Siberia, which is not called colonization. Usually in Russian, it's called conquest of Siberia, um, with the, uh, with like a, um, an element of supremacy uh, and um, uh, and um, there is there is a discussion. Is, uh, was Siberia a colony or group of colonies or not? Uh, so again, Alexander Edkind introduced um, uh, a term internal colonization uh, when uh, there are countries um, whose colonies are not overseas but become a part of the metropole um, in comparison to European colonization of Africa, for instance, when appropriation of the lands and natural resources went together with the enslavement of the indigent people. Uh, in case of Russia, indigents were not enslaved and preserved their culture, traditional ways of life, and religions. There were violent attempts to turn some northern indigent people into Christianity, but it met the strongest resistance. And uh, after all, Russia did not try to assimilate them. What it did, what it needed from them was just natural resources. At the beginning, it was not well, it was fur. Sable fox, polar fox, mink, etc. Animal skins. For centuries, of, up to the October Revolution in 1916, indigents were paying uh, so-called yasak. Yasak, which is a uh, fur tribute to Russia. Um, here, uh, well, so the, the Russian conquest of Siberia, uh, Far East and other territories did not actually entail slavery. However, today Putin's war yet reveals another phase of colonial extractivism. Siberia, Far East um, and other regions provide the center Moscow, with both non-human and human resources that serve as fuels, the body of the oil, gas, diamonds, and uh, oil, uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, and the body of the people that are sent to die. Um, here I quote, no, I, 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 I think uh, it's, the time is over, more or less, so I, I must conclude, right? Right, I, I don't have, yeah, okay. So because um, we cannot, uh, we can talk about it uh, in the discussion, uh, but for now, um, uh, I must say that, so 
that my basic argument is that uh, fossil fascism is, uh, uh, is not like a random coincidence or uh, misfortune or something, but a systemic effect of the global capitalist circulation of power, money, and blood. The picture when, so when I, uh, when I came to Norway, I was so impressed. I was thinking, oh my God, a happy nation. How could they, they, uh, they did, everything is so good, uh, but, but it, it's so good that it cannot be true. <laughs> something something is, is wrong in the picture. What, what is wrong? Uh, what is missing? What is missing is the entire picture, which is um, like, um, there can be no, as Lenin said, there can be no sociali uh, socialism in one separate country because, uh, yeah, no, because, uh, and the picture when one country or people is better than others is a little bit too simple. As long as we extract oil and exchange it for money, the trap of the oil curse uh, remain, uh, remains open. And Russia shows uh, one of the, just one of the possible scenarios of its developments, but, but there can be others. Uh, so, uh, the world does not consist of separate independent countries, but each country is included in the complex global network of capitalist uh, exchange, where, as we could see from yesterday, serial stocks, for instance, Africa must be really uh, like cautious about the ways how the Western companies are trying to, uh, to um, uh, under the geese of the care of a, of a cle uh, cleaner and, 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 and greener uh, capitalist development actually uh, to, uh, to, um, to maintain ways of like exploiting, exploiting human and natural resources in different ways. And, um, uh, and uh, the, the other international strategies um, of um, uh, companies, uh, companies and corporations and states, or so as corporations, must be taken into account. Now, uh, thank you. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks. That was great. Uh, I, I forgot to introduce myself um, at the start, so I'll do that right now. Um, I'm Jordan. Uh, I was a postdoc at McGill, and I'm a postdoc at Harvard in, on September 1st. Uh, yeah, there we are. I'll be short. I have maybe five minutes. Um, so my comments will be primarily about how the war uh, in Ukraine has revitalized a tired promotional discourse in the oil sands that reinforces uh, Oksana's argument about the planetary oil curse. So while a material war is underway in Eastern Europe, in Canada, an oil culture war is taking place uh, with mutually reinforcing tendencies. So for those uh, from outside of Canada at this conference, Canadians probably seem to be pretty obsessed with the oil sands. Uh, there's a reason for that. They're really bad. Uh, and for the same reasons that Oksana outlined about Siberian oil production. So yesterday we heard about some debates about keeping it in the ground uh, and extractive sovereignty of sorts in Nigeria, which makes sense given that in the Niger Delta, the oil is a sweet crude sitting close to the surface for reasons of historical geological conditions. And so it's easy enough to refine that as we saw yesterday, modular artisanal refineries have popped up. In Alberta, however, keeping it in the ground uh, makes sense instead of some kind of extractive sovereignty uh, given the materiality of the oil sands themselves. So bitumen, which make up the sands, is a kind of sticky, rocky formation, and it's extremely capital and resource intensive to turn into what resembles something like a cre sweet crude. So that as far as I can imagine, such kind of guerrilla or indigenous uh, refining is virtually impossible in this circumstance. In fact, the oil sands only relatively recently became a functioning mega project, given how difficult it is to refine. So in something like, uh, I think, 1967, uh, I don't have all the stats in front of me, uh, the first commercial uh, oil sands project came online called Great Canadian Oil Sands. And so the strategy was this, uh, divert 
water from the Athabasca River uh, to be used in the upgrading and refining process, treat that water, and then put it back into the Athabasca River. But that didn't happen because engineers never figured out how to treat the tailings uh, that came to be able to be put back into the flows of that river. And so now something like 1.4 trillion liters of tailings uh, exist, and you can see those here uh, on Tar Island uh, in Alberta. And they've been, the tailings ponds were a temporary solution that have now sort of breached and actually are leaching into groundwater. Uh, this has been proven a couple times very recently. And so the very condition for the creation of the tailings ponds has actually uh, been nullified essentially. So ecological destruction on the one hand and ongoing territorial dispossession, uh, some of which we saw happening in, in Russia, uh, are, in my view, the keywords of the oil sands driving relations, a kind of Canadian petro-imperialism in the first and last instance. So in the shadow of this deepening dyadic catastrophe, it is interesting, maybe even frightening, to see how Canadian oil is being framed as a potential savior via questions of energy security in the face uh, of the war. For about a decade, I've been studying how Canadian oil has been promoted as ethical and here is uh, a book from 2010 that kind of kick-started this process uh, of sort of institutionalizing this discourse. The argument goes something like this. Since Canada, like Norway, is one of the few liberal democracies producing oil, its oil is inflected by these same social and political characteristics. I call this making ethical a process of refining. And so in the face of energy crisis brought on by war, an immediate response by the agents, architects, and allies of Canada's fossil economy has been to intensify this process of refining. It's an appealing and convincing prospect for many, undermining any kind of serious discussions of keeping it in the ground. And so here we have uh, tweets from Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney very immediately after uh, the Russian invasion. So we see sort of two things happening here. One is condemning the uh, invasion, and then the other is promoting uh, Canadian oil as a solution uh, to resolving sort of the energy crisis that's been brought into being from this war in the same breath, uh, basically. It's an appealing and convincing prospect for many, uh, yeah, undermining any kind of serious discussion of keeping it in the ground with op-eds like this one circulating in national inter international media. So I don't really have any super smart things to say other than that this episode has revealed how tenuous and unstable prospects for transition are in the present. And perhaps uh, further intensification of oil sands production, which has been rationalized by wartime scarcity, is another kind of death drive, one that trips over itself to maintain and reproduce the fossilized uh, status quo. And those are my comments uh, in response. And so we have uh, 20 minutes or so for conversation. Please feel free to, yeah, and anyone that has questions. Or, uh, oh, okay, I just, <laughs> short, I, I, I was thinking about it yesterday and today uh, about this reinforcement of the advertisement of, uh, of um, other uh, markets, uh, of other oil markets, and, uh, and uh, I wanted to refer to, uh, to a book uh, uh, I've just read by Alexander Klose and um, Benjamin Steininger, which is called... Uh, uh, oil at, uh, Atlas of Petro Modernity, which will be translated into English soon, but it's already it already exists in Russian, and um, very well read there. Um, they talk about true oil, uh, so a way of uh, dependency uh, is uh, uh, like uh, really comparable to the one depicted in the series uh, True Blood. Uh, 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 it's, um, it's all, um, uh, all, uh, all attempts on reduction or uh, replacement of oil with other sources are somehow encounter this, uh, this moment of enjoyment. Of the, the, the unconscious, uh, uh, Jordan mentioned that I was talking about oil as the unconscious of the world, but unconscious is something that, uh, that relates to the enjoyment, but it's, it's a it's a kind of collective enjoyment uh, of, uh, of combustion, of um, uh, 
of uh, fueling uh, of fossil fuel uh, somehow um, as as it becomes uh, as becomes a substance that feeds um, feeds uh, the global capitalist machine. Uh, it's interesting to think about the nature of this dependency uh, because um, because um, there is a term uh, pharmacon. Uh, you, um, um, Jacques Derrida discusses this term with uh, regards to Plato, uh, Socrates, uh, and um, uh, their discussion on um, on pharmacon as both uh, poison and cure. So it it can be anything. You you get too much, you are poisoned, but you uh, you can also um, uh, be cured. Uh, so this this ambivalence we cannot avoid this ambivalence of the oil culture, uh, of petroculture in, in general, because uh, it it's like its principle. We are always uh, at the edge somehow. We uh, we are always in this moment of of danger, uh, and uh, uh, we cannot secure a space where we can only be cured without being poisoned at the same time. So one place is cured, the other is poisoned. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's an interesting movement, yeah. We'll, um, we'll uh, take two questions at a time. So if we can just answer two questions at the same time, that'd be good. So. Uh, thank you very much, Oksana, for your very interesting. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much, Oksana, for your very interesting talk. Um, I, um, uh, you know, these maps that you showed, uh, uh, um, especially the ones that, that you made with these arrows of oil and gas that flow uh, in different directions. And uh, um, I mean, I, I would say that like the picture is a bit more complex after the war, the, the, the lines are getting a bit thinner. And uh, there are many reasons why they're getting thinner, but one of them uh, that is not discussed too much is actually um, you know, local sabotage actions in different places along those flows. And uh, even here in the UK, uh, not here, but in the UK, there were reports about like uh, uh, dock workers, for example, refusing to unload uh, 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 loads with the Russian uh, uh, petro products and stuff like that. And we also know that in, like for example, in uh, Belarus, uh, Railway workers, to at great risks to themselves, stop flows of uh, you know the, the war-related military goods to to Ukraine. Uh, I'm just wondering what can we also like you yourself mentioned how in Russia the flows can be stopped uh, and they are stopped like right now for example for three days. Uh, earlier it happened also with Kazakhstani oil which was prevented from flowing to Europe. Uh, 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 you know, at will. I'm just wondering what, is there any potential to disrupt these flows of oil uh, and gas uh, from within Russia, especially considering that, as you mentioned, like Siberia is now not getting anything in return for its oil. Is there any chance, like, and given all this, you know, the, the culture of protest that you mentioned and the history of labor sabotage and all these things that have been part of Russian and Soviet history, uh, is there any possibility for uh, resistance on that front? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I love your question. Uh, is there a recording? Uh, no? uh, yes. Ah, okay. Then uh, I, I still love your question. <laughs> but, um, uh, I have some limits in, in replying it because I have to go back to Russia. But uh, yeah, uh, the, um, the, the direct actions that you mentioned uh, are really have in place. And it's, uh, I didn't, uh, so I skipped the last, um, uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to say something about resistance, uh, but um, um, I decided to leave it for the questions. So um, another line of movement would be a partisan war indeed. Uh, and it does have place, uh, and uh, the, in, what is really cool about that is that it is totally decentralized. Uh, so um, it's a rhizomatic structure, uh, and um, the, the, there are no leaders. Uh, there are uh, railway um, partisans that 
stop the trains, actually. They stop the trains that goes from, again, from Siberia to, uh, and recently they stopped uh, even Trans-Siberian um, Railroad for, for, for a while. Um, uh, they stop the trains that bring um, military techniques from, uh, from, again, from east to west. Uh, and uh, uh, there are, um, well, uh, uh, certain, uh, there is a movement, but, it, but it's quite, uh, well, uh, it's not that strong, uh, but uh, kind of strike movement uh, and, uh, and the work in sabotage movement. Uh, there are uh, cases of like public resistance and people from the media uh, doing statements, doing public statements, which is also important. So all these things are, are like super important, this partisan uh, war. Uh, but uh, again, I, I checked carefully. There is a nice book written by already mentioned um, Andreas Malm. Um, uh, last year, in 2021, uh, which, co uh, which is called How to Blow a Pipeline. And he refers to a paradox. He's saying why environmental activists are so nice. Why, uh, <laughs> like, nothing really, so they do so many actions, but, but, but this is never like a really um, a terrorist action or something. They never blow a gasoline station or a pipeline. Why? Why? This could be so easy, but they never do that. Uh, and uh, now with war, now, uh, with the current war, uh, this question, uh, this question is even more somehow um, striking, uh, because, uh, and this is uh, really uh, like, uh, this is there, there is some something um, mysterious about that. The oil pipes remain untouched. There was one or two cases where actually uh, there were attempts to uh, attack on the on the oil or rather gas um, infrastructures uh, on the on the uh, on the Russian uh, Ukrainian border. In um, uh, but uh, but it's not really often the case. Um, so strategically speaking. Um, the, the partisan war is not the only, me, the only not the only means of resistance, but um, um, in a certain larger scale, there are discussions on the decolonizing of Russia, which are also tricky indeed. What people will say in Buryatia, they will say, we, we do not want to be decolonized because we do not want to become a part of China or something, to become a colony of someone else. Uh, and um, uh, so decolonizing one, uh, one separate culture within the, the global uh, imperialist network uh, is, uh, is something to be really thought through because, um, because there are deadlocks, um, deadlocks for, for the entire movement of decolonization. But actually, uh, it would be interesting just to fantasize, I mean, in contemporary art or something, in a performance, uh, what the world would uh, would look like if Siberia would close the pipes? Um, I mean, um, it's just like a fantasy, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. Sorry, he he gave me that. I mean, <laughs> if Siberia will close the pipes, uh, the war will stop soon. Yeah. Um, thanks. But the, the Germany will got <laughs> frozen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for this. Um, uh, your account of these these flows of of oil and gas and money and uh, bodies uh, back and forth is is really clarifying. Um, and uh, it, it feels to me like like something is missing that Jordan's talk started to get at, and then and then your your question, sorry, your uh, question about whether this uh, event would be recorded uh, is is getting at, and that is uh, the flows of information and the flows of imaginaries. Uh, it seems to me like those have to be involved in this kind of turn on a dime from revolution to to fascism. Um, and so I, I wonder if you could tell us a little more about that. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, of, of Corneille's idea about the, the nation's two bodies and, and the natural body and the 
the, the people as the body of the nation. And, and, and I think part of what he's getting at, or what I take from him, is that uh, ideology is, makes a claim about the proper relation between those two bodies, right? And so can you help us think about the, the kind of ideational um, aspects of, of what keep these flows going. I mean, your last thing about Siberia turning off the, pa the tap is, is a kind of fantasy that, that could become uh, reality. I, I think that you get the, the gist of my question, but thank you very much. I have a, if I can, uh, I haven't even uh, wild a fantasy, um, which is more, um, uh, which uh, relates a little bit. I use the same method uh, as I used in my book on the solar economy and also in the, the article on the oil that you mentioned. Um, I was talking about the, the solidarity with the non-human in general. Um, the basis for which is, uh, is actually this equation of people to oil. So as Alexander uh, uh, said yesterday in concluding his talk uh, at one of the panels, um, we are oil. Uh, it can be understood in a different, uh, this thesis, uh, thesis can be understood in different ways, but uh, one of the ways is that there is a certain ground for solidarity or ungrounding for solidarity, uh, which is if we are oil, it's not that um, uh, it can be understood as there is something human in the oil that is exploited, that is, um, that is sold, but there is something oily in ourselves, something explosive, something uh, substantial, uh, and something that Hegel would call um, a substance becoming subject or, uh, or uh, whatever. Uh, so um, I would fantasize about uh, if I were an artist, say, I'm not, but I would fantasize about the ways of solidarity and, uh, and the dialectics between these two bodies, the body of the people and the body of oil. Uh, and their communication uh, in which oil uh, would reveal its, um, its um, um, radical potential. It can be something ready. It's, it's, as, I told, as I told you, it's ambivalent. So it can be something ready, like the sun, which can burn you down, but which also can uh, give you everything. And this... Um, uh, and this um, uh, goes to the idea of the gift giving, but this is another story. So yeah. maybe, yeah. Yeah, we can. I'm there was a question back here. I think yeah. that I don't want to miss. Uh, so actually, there are there are. Uh, so we have four questions now, and I think we have to set a uh, limit there. Um, but I think the one in the back was first because I can. Okay, see Okay, and then there are right? two here, and then uh, Bjorn has one. So here, Bjorn's, and then two here, and we can take them all at once. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, um, yeah, first of all, thank you. Um, I'm an artist, so like it's a little intimidating speaking around people who I know are like, you know, political theorists and, you know, career academics. But um, I, I guess there's something that, you know, your talk made me really, um, it's very emotional, right? Like it's, it's, it's very lived for you and your experience of your government. And um, like I live in the United States, so I think we, we, it's almost like um, we're in the same position, but coming at it from a very different place. And um, I guess the way that I frame like Russian geopolitics is always in opposition to like conceptions of Western European or American empire. So there's, there's some kind of centering of capitalism and like also liberalism that implicitly makes me a little uncomfortable but what I wanted to talk about was actually this kind of mapping um, that was kind of alluded to over there. Um, I, 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 I know you, you kind of like said, oh, I'm not an artist or you know, I, I'm not so good at this, but I think it's actually a very serious, a very serious graphic that you've shown, right? Like because um, you've shown arrows and the arrows have like, it's a vector, it's a movement that moves one way. And to me, there's something, um, reductionist in that visual language um, 
and I think there there needs to be a kind of more open and honest discussion about like Europe's complicity in facilitating these conflicts or um, you know, as was spoken yesterday in making financial uh, mechanisms available, you know, this idea of creating market, but with conditionalities, um, which Cyril spoke to, I think, really beautifully. Um, and the way that that precludes the creation of like um, kind of alternative possibilities. And then so within that map, the, I think the thing that spoke to me most deeply was the omission of the East. And that's what I think is the most promising part of your argument is that you know, we don't need to kind of um, perhaps in this discourse right now continue to center this kind of, um, you know, horrifying and obviously problematic conflict. Like we can begin to perhaps like through this kind of beautiful act of walking and through these kind of like alternative conceptions of community begin to actually like, you know, look outside of Moscow, look outside of Western Europe, look outside of liberal institutions and towards something else. And so I would, I would kind of ask that you do kind of like, uh, and I guess this is really more of a comment, but uh, that you do take that act of mapping much more seriously and perhaps begin to orient it around the East. And in the same way that right now the East is rendered invisible in that map, to have the kind of um, uh, strength of commitment to the, this kind of idea to actually render, um, if, if, if something's going to be rendered invisible, r render Western Europe invisible. You know, kind of render the mechanisms that are centering themselves and centering and kind of creating this conflict and, and, and use this kind of like, um, this place that inspires you so much to kind of uh, you know, perhaps grow um, your uh, critique. Thank you. Um, there is a. Can I answer now? Uh, we we need to, uh, to probably take, take them all together then, if if yeah. possible. So mm -hmm. there is there is one question. Bjorn, you had a question here. Yeah. Yes, I want to to come back to the to the question. We we are uh, the oil, and I think there was one something very fascinating in the idea that we are somehow the planet so that the the Russian the Russian natural gas comes via our chemical industry into our bodies and I mean it's something something uh, nice to be connected in in that way and so uh, and but it the problem is that it's this goes in in, in one direction if if everyone would would be the planet uh, in its total, in its, tot in its totality, then maybe it would be it would be better. But you only showed one directional uh, arrows on the map. Um, thank you so much, Roxana, for this amazing and brilliant um, uh, talk. Um, I make a very quick question. Um, I'm really curious to know more about um, the legal and international structures of sanctions and embargo and how complex they are and how ex existential they are in terms of experiencing sanctions and uh, an embargo. That's how much... Um, um, the impeding the flow of, of oil through different legal structures of sanctions is actually, you know, can also create other flows of oil elsewhere and different ways that sanctions, um, you know, in the case of Iran, for instance, um, creates different forms of um, movement of oil and black markets and how um, oil is sold um, on the tankers in, in the ocean and whatnot. So different ways that um, these um, overlapping Cases of different sanctions and embargoes on different, like petro states, case of Iran or Venezuela at the moment, or Cuba, or also uh, not a petro state. But um, yeah, what, um, just I'm really curious to know more about um, the, the sanctions and um, yeah, and how they um, impede the flow, but also create other forms of flow elsewhere that are quite hidden and invisible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I, I can, no, I can uh, message. You'll have to say time. tomorrow. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, so, um, many complicated questions, uh, three complicated questions. First, um, they're um, talking about the other East and the geopolitics. Um, there, is, uh, there is a big problem with geopolitics and geopolitical view in general. So, um, Geopolitical view is a proto-colonialist uh, per se. Uh, like it takes into account interests, political strategic interests of uh, certain units, uh, like sover 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 sovereign states. Uh, and um, from the point of view uh, of geopolitics, uh, lives, 
form of uh, forms of lives uh, are not uh, are invisible. Um, we we cannot see the people from the geopolitical through the geopolitical lens. Therefore, I uh, in my uh, discourse on the war. I uh, oppose rather uh, geophilosophy to the geopolitics because geophilosophy takes into account the landscape, the forms of life, and uh, the exchanges that are uh, that are somehow beneath or beyond the geopolitical framework. Uh, and uh, so geopolitical is often taken by uh, different kind of conservatives uh, and um, the official discourses, uh, which in in some uh, Western perspectives, pictures uh, Putin as a kind of last communist fighting against NATO a capitalist expansion, which is like the biggest illusion ever, because uh, uh, Russian Russian uh, imperialism is another uh, is another uh, one capitalism against another capitalism. Uh, and uh, so one, one way of expansion against another one. But uh, so, uh, so geo uh, geopolitical uh, perspective, uh, geophilosophical is different because, for instance, it considers the ground and the underground. Uh, so returning to uh, the question of uh, uh, solidarity, so to the point of solidarity, for instance, what is uh, what is uh, what is in common um, between oil, also oil, and now us, the people, is that we too are going underground, uh, in a certain Lenin Lenin's uh, sense, go underground. Um, what is going on underground? There is a, a kind of a root movement, the way. Um, uh, the way uh, uh, proposed by uh, Alexander the Shaman uh, to walk from Yakutsk to uh, uh, to Russia uh, to Moscow was actually a, a, a kind of a root movement. What, what is uh, the difference of a root? I mean, the plant. How does plant move? It moves by its roots, for instance. Uh, and uh, what is it? Uh, you you stay here. Uh, there is a point A and there is a point B here, but you move without leaving the initial point. So you expand. Uh, you expand, and um, uh, this is all goes uh, subsoil, almost like the oil pipe. Uh, yeah, so there is something in common. Uh, and um, talking then about the other East, I would mention uh, the other author, which is very uh, relevant for me, uh, I, uh, I worked uh, with his book, It's Reza Nigaristani. I worked um, on his book, uh, Cyclonopedia, a uh, while ago when I, I just began to think about oil and its own uh, agency. Uh, and, uh, and he was talking about uh, oil and its relation to war uh, in terms of the two machines. He was saying uh, uh, that there are two war machines. One is a jihad uh, machine, like Islamic war machine, and the other that comes from the de desert. Uh, and the one is uh, like anti the war on terror uh, or Western war machine. Uh, on, the, uh, on the side of like uh, the, Western, uh, the Western war machine is uh, on the other side of the pipeline. Uh, it's a place of consumption uh, and, um, and the place of production is a jihad. These machine, uh, machines are like a one, uh, create one complex actually. They are inseparable, uh, inseparable. They work together. This is one and the same strategy. Uh, which uh, Nigaristani also calls apocalyptic strategy, uh, and in which oil has its own agency somehow. Uh, I was thinking back at the time that um, that, uh, that Russia is has something some some something different. Uh, maybe it's a different machine or something. But now I realize that um, its place is like precisely in between because it. Uh, it has some traces of uh, jihad, indeed, 
uh, and in, in the rhetorics of the Russian uh, today's media, uh, it's a traditional, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fight for the defense of the spiritual tradition, for the traditional patriarchy against feminism, against uh, uh, like West in general, what is for Russians, what is West? It's first of all, like feminism and LGBT uh, and uh, all this kind of um, um, decadence, so to say. And Russia represents, the, the, the Russian empire represents the tradition. So this, this is a jihadist mo uh, moment, uh, which is actually confirmed by recent Russian um, international uh, affairs, uh, our new friends, who are the new friends of Russia, partners, uh, business partners, political partners, uh, Taliban, for instance. So now we have um, um, contracts with Taliban, uh, barter contracts. We, we give them oil uh, and what they give us back, medical herbs. Medical herbs from Afghanistan. I think it's something, yeah, it's something uh, interesting to think about. Um, and um, we should we should probably take the next yeah question. next yeah. Uh, next question Sorry. was uh, we're basically was, out of time, uh, but uh, we are the planet. I mean, uh, we are indeed the planet, but the planet is not necessarily something super good. Uh, <laughs> so again, uh, uh, there isn't. Ambivalence and uh, and about uh, so sanctions, really short yeah. sanctions uh, sanctions uh, what uh, uh, not even existential but I would say they have a very strong ideological impact so sanctions uh, Western sanctions against um, Russian Federation mostly harm uh, uh, not corporations not the state uh, not the, the businessmen but uh, rather um, ordinary people. So uh, uh, together with the um, ideological uh, atmosphere, the general ideological atmosphere and the, the, the propaganda, the official propaganda, sanctions work in such a way that they uh, um, unite the people around the leader so that the people basically think, okay, maybe they, they didn't like Putin before, because they are in poverty, they, uh, the, the life is bad, and so on and so forth. They are dispossessed. But what they, do they see? That probably he is right, because uh, Western countries are all united against uh, Mother Russia. That's what uh, ordinary people think. And, uh, and that's how ideology turns into, so, uh, into a bigger support uh, of the politics of the Russian uh, state also the support of the war. Um, that's how they get the supporters. Uh, and that's amazing, like why? Uh, so uh, uh, interestingly, it doesn't stop the war, but it's kind of uh, somehow, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, everything is, is more difficult than, than it seemed to be. Uh, yeah, and, and indeed, uh, in, on a practical level, sanctions are, uh, can be avoided, but, uh, but uh, you, you, we have the experience of Iran. So now we are learning to use parallel imports, to use VPN, to use uh, all, the, um, uh, all the strategies of living, uh, <laughs> uh, living um, with the many limitations. Uh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, thanks, everyone. Sorry for going over a little bit, but...